Welcome, I'm Chris Roberts. Welcome to the, the Long Road. And um, <clears throat> we're going to have a few interesting things today. Um, maybe a little C-SPAN, a little um, kind of Glenn Beck on his um, clipboard. And we'll see what happens. Boy, I'm looking at the um, TV. This tie and this shirt look much better in my house, but it looks kind of different colors right now on the TV. So, you know, maybe I'm colorblind today. <clears throat> a couple of things be before we go, we stop. I'd like to thank the people that come up to me in the store and tap me on the back or say hello or give me their names. <clears throat> the last one was Tim at Hannaford's and say they watched the show and they enjoyed the show. Um, I enjoy putting it on for you and providing as much information as I possibly can. <clears throat> this one <clears throat> for the lady that said I should be able to, I should write a book about the stuff and I says <clears throat> I, I kind of did in the past and um, I have one right. This one I wrote um, never allow anyone to place limitations. I stayed up all night before, um, on December 6, 2006, um, before I went for major cancer surgery. I didn't know how it was going to come out. It was touch and go. So I stayed up all night and um, <clears throat> sent it to the publisher. And um, basically what I did was I did this for my, my kids and my wife because I just want to explain a number of things, why I did things, and um, how my personality was um, developed. And then as I went through, I had um, some more stuff. And, and what I've done is I just keep adding more and more in, and I kind of leave it as a resource book. And this one, which I did a few years ago, was 450 pages. And that's sometimes I call, sometimes the I say it all. And my most recent one named Pivotal Choices, just talking about different things that happen and what you do and what choices you have to make. Again, for my kids and, well, they're not kids anymore, they're adults, but I do it for my um, grandkids. And what I do is I um, continue to keep adding things, whether I hear things, um, read things, or... Um, <clears throat> watch something in the movie and it's something that grabs me, I, I put it down. And right now on this one it's 542 pages, about 2,000 um, different authors. And as you can see on these, I, I keep them clipped. Um, I put kind of, um, if I'm writing a, an important speech on the, the floor, like if on a house floor and I'm fighting for marriage equality, I put the speech in here and explain why I gave the speech and just different events. And basically, I'm getting ready to do my next one, and it's up to about 660 pages. And for the, um, the lady that we, I talked to and, and some of the other ones, I've given out these books to, to other people. I'm not interested in, in selling them and because they're for my um, <clears throat> grandkids. But on the, the website, chrisyrobertsadventures.com, You'll see a picture, and you can get the PDF file if you want to do it and read it. And um, to me, books like this are, are really important to, you know, help tell your history, help um, with your um, children and your grandchildren. And just it just opens them up, and it get, gives you the idea to experience um, new people. And because basically, I've got about 2,500 years of authors in that book. Things that are just important. I put things in I had no idea whatsoever and sometimes five, ten years later it comes up and it seems to be um, quite important. So I would recommend anybody do something like that. I call them my genius books and people think that um, I'm pretty smart but being smart is knowing where to um, get the answer not having everything in your head. So Moving on, I had some positive comments about the General Zinni um, segment that we had on last time. General, City, General Zinni, pretty impressive person. Um, 
I lucked out. I had the opportunity to be minted by um, General Zinni twice for about a period of three years. And um, I just wish we had uh, more leaders like that. If we had people like that in um, Congress, I think we'd get a heck of a lot more done. So what I'm going to do now is um, move on to, as I'll call it, the idiots in, um, in Concord. And it's really amazing some of the stuff that, that comes out of Concord. If anybody, if you read the Keen Sentinel, Sunday Keen Sentinel, one of the headlines, one stabbed and another hurt in a UNH brawl. Two university um, New Hampshire students were injured Saturday morning during a brawl during which one student was stabbed by another and another was hit on the head with a blunt object. And just think, we in Concord are saying it is perfectly all right to, um, for kids to have guns on um, college campuses. You know, you, we can say 18, 19, 20-year-olds are, are men, but whether us guys want to admit it, scientific research seems to show we really don't, brain doesn't really develop, we really don't fully mature until about the age of 25. So just think, 19, 20-year-old kids, excuse <coughs> me, drinking, getting in an argument, and um, they have guns. We got the other law in um, New Hampshire which says you have um, perfectly right to pull out a gun, shoot somebody to protect yourself. Well, if someone was going to hit me with a blunt object, I pull. If I have a gun, concealed weapon, I pull it out. I kill him. The law says I have a right to defend myself, and um, there can be no legal recourse against me because I was defending myself. Well, and it's my definition of how am I defending myself. I don't know if the law goes and says, well, what happens if I instigated the thing, I attack someone else, and someone else took a, a, a baseball bat at my head, and I shot him, and I killed him. The law says I should be protected. So those are some of the um, unintended consequences of um, some of the laws. Another idiotic bill that's coming through is... Um, for the people, I think it was, what, in the late 90s when um, New England had that um, massive um, ice storm that went right up into Quebec and shut down um, electricity and a lot of stuff for about a week to 10 days, not counting the ice storm of, um, I think it was 2008. Well, a lot of the electric companies have an agreement in, um, it's with Canada with the Emergency Management Assistant Compact. So if we have a major um, ice storm, for example, in, in northern New Hampshire, even in New, southern New Hampshire that shuts down the, our electricity, not only can we have um, electrical crews from around the country come, the ones from Canada can come down and help out. And if Canada, Quebec, Montreal has a problem, we go up and we can help them out. But one of the laws that um, we're looking at is it removes Canada from the Emergency Management Compact. If adopted, New Hampshire could not ask help from Canada, and Canada could not ask for our help in an event of a catastrophe. And some wonder, what are some of these people thinking? The Canadians are not our enemies. The Canadians, and shoot. In northern New Hampshire, there's a lot of French Canadians. Manchester is a lot of French Canadians. And we're saying, you know what, Canada, we don't trust you. We don't want you to help us. So I guess in certain ways, if you put it bluntly, if we have an ice storm and it shuts down um, the electric power to a lot of elderly, and elderly freeze to death over a three- to four-day period because they have no heat, that is Okay because we don't want to have an agreement with Canada. It's going to make it against the law for a utility company in northern New Hampshire to ask Canada to come to the United States and help New Hampshire residents. Wait a minute. I thought we were elected to um, help residents. <clears throat> then the, the other one that uh, more and more people are saying is, what the hell is going on in New Hampshire? 
a bill that would let businesses refuse gays. And um, the individual, he goes, for example, business owner in Nashua could be charged with discrimination for refusing to work at a same-sex marriage ceremony next door in Tingsboro's Mass, where gays and lesbian, lesbian marriage is also legal. And all I go is, duh, if I'm, a, it doesn't matter if I'm a New Hampshire business, I mean, if I'm a New Hampshire business and I go to Massachusetts to perform a service, I have to follow the laws of Massachusetts. New, I can't go and say to Massachusetts and say, you know what, I'm going into Massachusetts, but the New Hampshire laws govern what I do in Massachusetts. Isn't it amazing how they want to follow the Constitution and they want to be um, state rules instead of federal rules? So we're going to have New Hampshire pass, these guys are going to attempt to pass a law in New Hampshire that's going to govern interstate commerce in Massachusetts. There are federal laws. The Constitution has determined what the federal, that the federal government is responsible for interstate commerce. The other part is, if I'm a business in New Hampshire and I'm a bigot and I don't want to get involved with same-sex weddings, why would I offer my services? I, you know, why would I offer my services for something I find disgusting? Okay. If I'm so bigoted and I find it disgusting, and you're going to say, I want, and I, you want to try to figure it out, it just doesn't seem to compute. Why would, and then the thing is, why would same sex couples who are going to get married in Massachusetts come from Massachusetts to New Hampshire to a knowingly bigoted business? and say, we want you to record the most important day of our lives. No, nope. it, again, it doesn't compute. And <clears throat> he goes, we are talking about religion, and we are going to force religion on someone else by the force of law. Fifty years ago, uh, <clears throat> our society tried to force racism, and 90 years ago it was discriminating against women before they had the right to vote. Whatever happened to respecting someone's beliefs, even if they're not on what is considered today to be critically correct? So, again, if I don't believe that women have the right to vote, that's my belief, and no one should be able to force that on me. You know, I would like to go... So what he's saying is, if I don't think women should have the right to vote, then I, and that's my personal belief, which it isn't, then I should have the right to tell my wife and my three daughters, you can't vote because my personal belief is women don't have the right to vote. And racism. Wait a minute. Fifty years ago, this country said, a bunch of people in this country said, racism is not right. Racism is not the American way. So this individual is saying, He's sick and tired that um, people who want to end racism are forcing that upon him. They're doing what is politically correct. Well, 50 years ago in Virginia, <clears throat> you couldn't, <clears throat> non-whites could not marry whites. Whether you're an Indian or you're Hispanic or you're black, you could not marry whites. We and took the Supreme Court to, to change that. Again, mm -hmm. So if someone goes and says, that's not my belief, I don't agree with it. To me, if you don't agree with it, then you don't have to marry someone of a different race or someone of a different nationality or ethnic group. You know, but where does it give you the right to say, <clears throat> if two people, black and white, black and Asian or whatever, happen to love each other, that they should not have the right to get married because... That's my personal belief. Again, that's not my personal belief because you don't want to see a black man and a white woman or a black woman and a white man or an Asian woman and a white man walking down the street holding hands or having children. Your saying is 
we should not pass a law <clears throat> to allow that to happen. This one, when you talk about here, if that's my religious beliefs and there are some religions, whites can only marry whites, then again, <clears throat> I don't have to serve anybody that doesn't follow my religion belief. I don't have to help anybody. You know, <clears throat> we went through that. That was a pretty dark period in the United States. We don't need to go that, again, that way again. We don't need to be represented, remembered as New Hampshire, the bigoted state. And <clears throat> so, yep, legislation that will allow business owners or employees ref to refuse service to same-sex couples who are getting married. Wait a minute. So, again, if I'm a business and I have a business and I contract to do a service with a same-sex couple, then all of a sudden I have one of my employees say, you know what, sir? I don't feel like working because I think it's wrong. And so I'm not working for it. Wait a minute. That individual works for me. I pay that individual's paycheck. I'm not doing anything wrong to that individual. That individual is doing exactly what all my other people, workers are doing. But now it's basically saying because of religious, um, he has a, re oh, nope. And I can't question it. How do I stay in business? <clears throat> and we have, even dumber, we have another bill coming through, HB 1517. A compromise bill went through the stating prohibiting the state in any political subdivision from entering in any agreement, implementing any provision of no child left behind without prior approval of the general court. Wait a minute. So if the federal government offers you money, say Keene, Keene cannot accept a penny of that money unless the general court, we in the House, vote to authorize them to, use, to, to go into a contract and get that money. It's like, wait a minute. So if we're not in session and bills could only be put in at a certain time, so... You can wait up to a year just before the court, and then it has to go to the progress. It may be 12, 15 months if, the, if everything goes quickly. And Well, you know what? That's over a fiscal year. So that money's going someplace else, and the people in New Hampshire are without. And basically it says, states that this bill prohibits the state from receiving, from accepting, and the local school committee districts from expending any state or federal funds for the purpose of enforcing, implementing, or implying any of this act's provisions are required. By doing so, the department states that the local school districts will not receive federal funding formulas offered through No Child Left Behind, which at 98% of which is direct pass-through funds to the, local to the local education authorities. Well, if this bill passes... That means New Hampshire would risk losing $61,607,122 next year. Okay, let's look at some of these. Career and college-ready students, Title I grants. The state gets over $40 million. Title I rewards, $842,000. School turnabout grants. Schools that are doing poorly and they need extra money to hire new students and stuff, $1,681,327, gone. Neglected and delinquent children in youth education. Not everybody's cut out to be a parent. Not everybody does the job right. So neglecting and delinquent children, the federal government gives the state of New Hampshire $445,000. We're talking about, yes, we should take care of our kids, but what we're saying is, Nope, we can't accept a half a million dollars to help our neglected kid, children. Effective teacher and leader state grants. <clears throat> it's one of those, any, if you graduate from college and you pass your t your, um, the test, you're already cl classified as a ho highly qualified teacher. Well, that's the bottom. You want teachers to grow, teachers to get better. We want people to be, the teachers to get up so they can monitor 
younger teachers. We want teachers to move up into administration so they can be vice principals and principals. We want principals to get better because a lot of the research says the most important person to determine how effective a school is, excuse me, and how well children develop are principals. And a lot of small communities can't afford to send their principals to college and to get advanced training. Go to King State College. King State College is not cheap, even for people for um, people who are residents of New Hampshire. UNH is not cheap, and that's not counting some of the costs of the um, private schools, colleges. So effective teacher and leadership state grants. New Hampshire stands to lose ten thousand four hundred and six thousand three hundred and twenty-two dollars. Rural and low-income school programs. We got a lot of kids around the state that um, getting free and reduced lunches. They're way out in the middle. And look at some of the people in the North Country. Look at some of the small schools. Again, we get another uh, million dollars um, for low-income schools gone. Small rural school achievement programs. It's one of those. If I'm in a small school, if I'm living in a small little town of two, 300 in New Hampshire, I should have the same opportunity as someone living in Keene or Durham or Dover or Portsmouth to reach my potential. I should get some of the same quality education. Otherwise, I'd be just stuck in a small town. We don't want to be stuck in a small town. We want our best and brightest to get the opportunity and grow. And um, they benefit their town. They benefit their, um, their state. But the school achievement program, one point. Four million dollars gone. English learner education. Right here in Franklin School, we have English as the second language, and it, it's critically important. We have children that come in and don't speak English. We got to get them to speak English so they can benefit from the school system. Again, almost a million dollars gone. Another one that we don't want to talk about: homeless children. Okay. Look at the homeless shelters in Keene. They're full. And it's just not adults. It's children. And those children need to be educated. We get $180,000 to help educate homeless children under the federal No Child Left Behind grant. Gone. And the last one, $3.9 million, assessing achievement. I don't care who you are. If, if you don't test it, people don't take it seriously. To pat someone on the back and say, yep, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're doing good. No, it has to be tested. It has to be evaluated. There's places like Mississippi and Tennessee and some of the other states. They're doing so much better than other states under No Child Left Behind guidelines. And the reason why they've done so better, so much better, they've dumbed down their tests so low that almost everybody can pass. So you can have the same tests. You may be in Mississippi, 30 may be passing. Or you may be in Massachusetts, which has the highest standards in the country, and um, 70 may be passing. So when you look at the numbers, <clears throat> you could have more, quote, using statistics, you can have more children failing the exam in Massachusetts on the percentage rate, you can say, well, 15% of the people in Massachusetts, students in Massachusetts fail No Child Left Behind because they um, flunked the test. And then you can say in Mississippi, only 3% of the kids in uh, Mississippi fail No Child Left Behind because they passed the test. Well, the kids in, kids in Massachusetts <clears throat> are getting 70 and the people in Mississippi, 30. So the kids in Massachusetts are more than two, two times as more um, proficient than the kids in um, Mississippi. <clears throat> and I have another article from the King Sentinel. It's almost kind of feeling like C-SPAN. And um, again, one of the things that we've been cutting um, out is um, funding for mental health illness. And... When I was growing up as a kid, and not too recently, and a lot of you probably remember, there was no such thing as mental illness. Mental illness was one of those things that was like cancer. 
you never told anybody that you had someone that was mentally ill in your family. Well, as we know, in a lot of times, mental illness can be more damaging and more devastating than um, <clears throat> regular illness. If I break my bone, compound fracture, people see it. I go to the doctor, I spend some time in a hospital, I get surgery, and it's fixed. I break my back, I have a head injury, there's a whole bunch of things that people see, it gets fixed, and I can, may not be as good as I was before, but I can still move on. Mental illness, you know, there's all kinds of reasons for mental illness, and some mental illness is, is temporary. Some people have PTSD, it's not, for a lot of people, it's not lifelong. It's basically you go and be treated and you get coping skills and you move on, you help understand it. Other people, you may have a death of a child and you go into depression. Yes, depression is a mental illness. And you go in, you may have talk therapy, you may take some antidepressants. And then all of a sudden, later on, you, you move on. You don't forget the, the loss of your child, but you can now function. And um, men, when they lose their job, some a lot of times they lose their um, identity, and they, and some unfortunately they, they feel worthless. They fail to realize that um, they're a person. They're more than their job. And one of the the serious devastating facts, mental illness can lead th to thoughts of suicide. In 2010, at least 8.7 million people thought seriously about taking their own lives. In that group, 2.5 million people made plans to kill themselves, and 1.1 million people in 2010 attempted suicide. <clears throat> well, you know what? It's more than 1.1 million. There's suicide by cops. There's suicide by car. And the unfortunate part was people... I really do not, don't want to put their family to the stigma of um, side. So they get in a car, high speed, get into an accident, and they say, well, fell asleep in the wheel, went off the road. You know, sometimes it's just them, and they don't understand the impact that it has on the, the people they leave behind. Other times, they take other innocent people with them. And so there's mental illness. And the unfortunate part is it doesn't cost that much money to ta take care of people, to give people the opportunity to sit down. And what they're saying is only 60% of the people that have mental illness ever receive treatment for it. And if you want to realize how bad it is, <clears throat> as the King Sentinel and other ones are talking about, a jails, county jail, our um, prisons are filling up with people with mental illness. And some of those people were physically or sexually or emotionally um, abused a, as children. And sometimes they don't, they don't feel that they belong. They don't feel they, they're worth anything. And so they become societal outcasts. And as become societal outcasts, they get in trouble. And a lot of times they end up in prison because they can't get a job or they go into drugs or whatever. When in fact, <clears throat> if they went down and they sat down with him and says, you know what, when you were sexually abused, you had nothing to do with that. You, weren't the, you, were, you were being victimized. Okay? It doesn't matter some, an adult saying it was your fault. No, you were being victimized. You're not the bad person. And let's sit down. Let me explain it to it. That was someone who was using the power of size or whatever to take advantage of you. And so let's sit down. Let's take care of you. And so you can, you may not forget the thing, but you can get on with an active um, <clears throat> life and a productive life. And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take about a two-minute break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about how the federal government likes to play number games. Okay, we'll be back in a few minutes.
welcome back. And um, <clears throat> the first thing number set we're going to do is with the um, the Federal Reserves and the banking system. And so one individual was talking about, you know what, it, it's easy to explain if you take all the zeros off. And so, and it's not going to be exact, but what I'm going to do is put it kind of in a, a wide brush explaining it. So say I'm a bank and I have $1,000. And the Federal Reserve says I have to keep ten dollars, ten percent on cash, and I take the other ninety percent and I give mortgages out. So ninety percent of my assets in um, as a collateral for the um, homes, and ten percent in cash. <clears throat> okay. Now all of a sudden, we have the housing bubble, and um, I lose and I lose forty percent of the housing percent screen. And now the real value of the housing, the house is only 50%. But now it leaves me in trouble. I've got to come up with the 40% that I've lost be between here. Loan loss. Now it's like, hmm, how can I do that? Well, first thing is if I rewrite the value of the houses down to the real value, then by law, but the Federal Reserve is going to make me come, and come up with that money or my bank will maybe shut down and taken over, my assets taken over by another bank. So, hmm, that's what happens. That's why you see so many foreclosed houses that banks don't want to sell. Because if it's 50... Um, if they lose 40%, they got to make it up someplace. That's why banks don't want to um, remortgage someone's house that's fallen behind because if the house was worth $400,000, now it's only worth $250,000. When you go and do a loan, now if you need 20%, um, percent, so basically the people need $50,000 in equity. And very few people can come up with that. So the bank would much rather foreclose on the house and keep the 400 k thousand on the books. <clears throat> but they still got to come up with a way to find the money. So what happens is the Federal Reserve goes and says, you know what, banks, we'll make the money almost non-existent. We can give you the money for free. And this is what they do, and the Federal Reserve said for the next, um, to 2014, it's almost going to be free money. So if I'm the bank and I go to Federal Reserve and get the money for 1%, it's less than that, but say we get it for 1%. And so I go and say, wait a minute, I can find someone to take this house at $400,000 at 3%. percent we'll make it 4% loan. Okay. Now as the bank, I've now taken, even if I go in and sell the house for $300,000, I've only taken a small loss, I've got a new loan, and now it's classified as a performing loan, and so again, it's making me um, look better because I want my stocks to go up and I want my dividends, to, the payouts goes up. But again, how does the bank do that? How do they make money? Well, what happens if I raise your credit card rate to 24%. And you go, what? So if I borrow money at 1% for $1,000, okay, I have to pay $10 to the Federal Reserve. Now you get $1,000 on your credit card, and I now charge you 24% that I may have been charging you 16 or 12 before, and so I get $240. Now I've just made a profit, basically, again, $230. That's why you've been talking about recently how the banks were able to make about $13 billion in profit over the last few years because the Federal Reserve has been basically loaning their money almost for free. And I had um, 
alone with one of the big, uh, I fixed up my house. I went and bought some stuff at the store. My loan, my interest rate was 18%. And about a year ago, they went and thought I'm, I'm up on all my bills. Says it's now 25.99. And they say, well, you know what? If you want to keep it, just pay off your um, bill. Just, just close the card, pay off it, and close it. Then you don't have to pay the interest rate. Well, if I go and pay off my card, that line of credit portion, I think it was $12,800, disappears. So it could have a negative effect on my credit rating. And so it puts you in the bind. There's a few other ones that did it to me, and they did it to a lot of other people. There were people who had interest rates at 9 12%, and they went up to 29%. So we're talking about why, is, why isn't the economy going better? Well, the reason the economy isn't going better is because we're paying all this extra money in interest. So, for example, me, I would have $180 in interest. That means I paid $60 more over the year. Then, again, that's a month. So that's $60. More. So that $60 I'm paying the bank in interest, that's $60 that I can't go out and buy something. So if I spent that $60 in Keen, it would roll over four, five, six times. Some economist says up to seven times, but just say five times. So I, that $60, if I had spent in Keene, would have been the equivalent of $300 worth of sales and businesses in Keene, just for me if I had $1,000. Instead, that $60 goes to Citibank, which services the, um, that company's credit card. But for the people that remembered 1986, when we had the savings and loans fiasco, when we had hundreds of banks failing, and it cost us about a half a trillion, the federal government and us taxpayers about a half a trillion dollars to cover the loss. Well, the big reason for that was a lot of banks had three, four, five, and six percent home mortgages. Well, Remember back then when you could get 12% on a CD? <clears throat> well, the bank only had a 3% mortgage, but it had to pay 12% to get money to keep servicing its loans and keep that 10%. And so what happened was, it was only a matter of time. You can't make money paying 12% paying on a CD if you, and cover your home mortgages if you only get even 6% on it. It's a losing proposition. So when you go and see home mortgage 8.4%, 4.25%, what happens when the prime interest rate goes up to 6 7 and 8% on these 30-year mortgages? Again, so the bank or the federal government will have to pay 8% for us to loan them the money, then in turn, they're, only, they're getting less than 4% back. Basically, we could be in a position four or five years from now being in a new savings and loan um, fiasco. But it's allowing the banks to make profit, and it's allowing the banks to pay dividends, and it's allowing the banks' um, <clears throat> stocks to go up. And Bernanke recently said one of his missions right, was now was to increase the value of stocks. <clears throat> and again, increase the value of stocks, that has nothing to do with us average um, Americans. If Mick Romney has $200 million in assets and he has it invested, let's say in the stock market, and he gets 10% um, return because the people up top with big money get good financial advisors, and um, they, get, they can get – so he gets a 10% return, so he makes $20 million. That's an investment, okay? That could be all capital gains. So he pays taxes at 15%, Okay. If I was to go out and make $75,000 in a year, I would pay higher taxes. I think it's around 
28% because these are our wages. And this is capital gains. <clears throat> so if you're working for your money, you're going to make, you're going to pay higher taxes. And then someone who has money and basically may not even have to work. <clears throat> That's the, the way the game plays. But the problem is, for example, I saw a five-year CD, 1.74% for five years. Well, the projected inflation rate for the next five years is 3%. So if we did it really quick, not compounding it, so that's 15%. Let's see, 3535, five, say 10 and a half. So in five years, even after the interest, my money would have lost 4.5% in value. Okay, And not only that, I would have had to pay taxes on my 1.74%. So plain and simple, while the Federal Reserve has helped creating money to keep the banks profitable so the banks can take care of the, their lo- the mortgage loss and pay dividends, and the stock market is g- getting better and better, the stock market isn't doing much at all for the average American because even with government bonds, it's pretty tough for the average American to get more than 2%. So the average American will not get a return greater than reflation, inflation, so they will be losing money every single year. And that's one of the problems when people are getting ready to retire. Where do they invest their money so they can cover the cost of their retirement? So... That's the Federal Reserve and its numbers. Here's a good one now, the the defense. You've been hearing about how the um, Department of Defense has to make 400, made $486 billion in cuts. And um, how it's going to have such a negative effect on the um, the American people and our defense. Again, it's out of fear. You know, one of those bear cat moments. In 2010, every, every man, woman, and child in the United States got a bill of $2,222 just to um, cover the cost of DOD. <clears throat> Last year, well, this year, the federal got the... Um, DOD got $531 billion base budget. Now, for next year, they're asking for $525 billion. Last year, they paid $115 billion for wars. Next year, they're asking $88 billion for wars, which is kind of strange because since Iraq has gone down, we're saying is the bill for Iraq was only $27 billion? I don't think so. Okay. So, yep, the Pentagon's going to cut $487 billion over 10 years. What's it going to cut? Basically, it's going to cut the size of the Army by a about 100,000, it's going to cut the size of the Marine Corps, and it's going to cut some older ships and get, get rid of some airplanes in the Air Force, okay? But the Army and the Marine Corps will still be bigger than it was pre-9-11. And so where's that $480, $487 billion coming from? Well, the Pentagon has a 10-year plan spending plan, okay? The Pentagon was planning on spending $6.75 trillion over the next 10 years. Under the new plan, they're only going to spend $625 trillion. In the next five years, in 2014 to 2018, the defense budget goes up every year. And next year would be the only one that goes down. So basically, 
when they're planning on ending the war in um, Afghanistan in 2014, most of the projected savings is going to come out of the war fund. Okay? And it's like, wait a minute, the war fund? So there's going to be very little saving, I mean, um, cuts to the active duty portion. And what's going to happen is, for example, in 1990, there was 570 ships in the Navy, and now it's going to be 285. Air Force, there was 5,000 aircraft. Now it's 3,750 man aircraft and 3,000 non-man aircraft. Okay. The <clears throat> right now it costs the Navy more money to to take care of and fund 285 ships than it did for around 570. And so when you look at the number, they've gotten rid of 285 ships, and it still costs more. The Air, the air Force has gotten rid of almost, well, 1,250 aircraft, and it still costs more money. Um, a lot of the missions are flown by um, drones, which are pretty um, cheap. They're not training, spending millions of dollars of training pilots. They're not spending $30, $40 million on aircraft or like the F-22, about $200 million, or the C-17, about $320 million. So the trick of the game is, you, what we're going to do is we're going to use the war drawing down as cost savings. Okay? And so of the projected growth of 10 years, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go in and take the $486 million billion out of what we are hoping to plan in the future. Again, not what we have, but we were hoping to plan in the future. So basically for the next 10 years, the defense budget will average $625 billion. Basically, when you look at next year's, uh, on an average of $100 billion a year more than it um, <clears throat> than what's going to be next year. So the bogus cuts, and even when the federal government's talking about taking out $1.2 trillion or even $4 trillion, it's not very little is coming out of hide. Most of it is coming out of future growth, future spending. So it's, again, playing some number games between the Federal Reserve and Department of Defense. That's how we play the, the number games. And one other thing, going back to the Federal Reserve, one of the reasons the Federal Reserve has to keep the interest rate so low is because the federal government has so much um, bonds and stuff that the Federal Reserve is bought up. And I think the last thing, the Federal Reserve is printed pretty close to, well, they use electronic numbers now, almost $2 trillion they created it. So that's what's keeping it in the, um, the thing going and keeping the interest rates low. Otherwise, if the interest rates came up to the normal um, where they should be, the federal government would probably have to pay between two and $300 billion a year more in interest. That's it. Interest for um, China and Indonesia and other people that own our um, treasury bills. So... Again, we and the Americans would end up getting screwed because that money would have to come out of the budget and we, we'd lose services or we would have to pay more taxes just to go to interest. When that happens, we all lose. So it's a number game. It's a shuffle. So, again, I hope I didn't bore you on that one, but I just wanted to help inform you. So time goes quickly, and so I'm, hopefully you enjoyed everything and it was knowledgeable, and again, if I see you and you see me, say hello. I appreciate it. And so see you out there on the long road and have a good day.